You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome to Tone Benders. Today we have something a little different. We're going to play an interview from another podcast series called Sound Perspective, done out of Australia by Alfred Faber. This podcast is very similar to what we do at Tone Menders, but has a focus on the sound work being done in Australia. Alfred covers the film Mad Max Fury Road extensively over multiple episodes, with his first episode being a really great documentary-style compilation of many interviews on the film. It's a fantastic document of the sound work that was done on that epic feature. There are also multiple follow-up episodes that feature the full-length, long-form interviews that made up the documentary. Other episodes feature a dream guest for us, Dean Hurley, who mostly works with David Lynch, Ben Osmo, a legendary location sound recordist, James Mather, who is a sound supervisor on many of the Harry Potter series, some amazing talks in there. But one of the unique things that Alfred and Sound Perspectives has been able to do is get access to some of Australia's most famous directors and talk to them about their relationship to the sound in their films. George Miller from Fury Road and many other films was a guest. Mike Green talked about his first feature, Outback. And possibly my favorite, Peter Weir was a guest. Peter is a six-time Oscar-nominated director of classics like Witness, Dead Poet Society, Master and Commander, and Truman Show, among many others. We're going to run that interview today on the Tonebenders feed. And in this interview, he talks about working with Alan Splett early on in his career, and then with Richard King on his more recent films. Peter is an all-timer when it comes to directing greats, and it's really great that we get to share this talk with the Tonebender listeners. If you want to hear more about Sound Perspective Podcast, you can find it on all the major podcast apps. You can find the host on Twitter at Alfie Faber Sound. That's at A-L-F-I-E-F-A-B-E-R-S-O-U-N-D, Alfie Faber Sound. And you can find the show on Twitter at Sound Perspect. So S-O-U-N-D-P-R-O-S-P-E-C-T. You can find simple links to all these things on the episode page on our site, ToneMendersPodcast.com. So without further ado, let's hear from the legend, Peter Weir. Here we go. Peter Weir, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. I love talking about sound. (laughs) That's great. Um, So I've I've heard lots of different directors talk Mm. about how they work with sound quite differently some are more kind of um hands off about it and delegate it to people and describe what they want and some are you know like david lynch who actually specifically says what he wants and ends up getting a credit for sound designer like what's your relationship like with it do you delegate funny you mentioned david lynch because i worked with his friend and sound designer alan splatt on two features in america and we were chatting one day and he's, you know, he was telling me about working, you know, with uh, David, his old friend. And it came up, I don't know how, because he wasn't a gossiper, but he said, uh, the only one that I didn't complete was Blue Velvet because the, the sound made me sick. He said I was working and he was someone who would work. If you wanted a steam train, he'd have half a dozen he was working on to get the right sound of the wheels or the steam or the... Uh, a dry, you know, a carriage going past. He was a perfectionist and an extremely sensitive man and a brilliant sound designer and a cellist, as it happened. That was his off-duty pleasure was to play his cello at home at night. Anyway, he said he was working, you know, with, with David, creating the sounds for that picture. But he said, uh, I was getting into an area with sounds so disturbing that he said I began to feel ill. And couldn't continue. Wow. (laughs) And said to David, I can't do this. Wow. So that was how. And in fact, around that time, into the studio walked David Lynch, who was up in San Francisco, the Zanz Studios. And um, we, you know, said hello to each other. But um, I'll never forget that story of how someone extremely sensitive to sound can be that affected. Wow. I was actually going to ask you about Alan Splett because I just found it interesting seeing the guy who had done a razor head working on Dead Poet Society. Yeah, yeah. Such different films, but... All got their sounds that, mm. you know, are relevant. I mean, obviously, it wasn't Dead Poets. It wasn't a, a picture that was calling on sound to do 
other than you know more conventional things but nonetheless you know he would you would find alan at any time of day or night in his little um workspace you know because it was still you know photochemical process and and sound in the way of uh, of tape and um magnetic sound and there he was cutting and splicing and you know he had two or three different turntables lined up and this small screen and you would go in and he would be working to death a scene that you would think was fairly straightforward someone you know moving through the trees or you know crossing various surfaces and then what the the ambient sounds inside were like compared to when it crossed outside and you know he'd he'd sort of chat to you and you know it's often late at night you know you'd think he you know he's been here since early morning but he and in the variations the subtlety differences between one little premix and another were noticeable and you were rapidly drawn into his uh, a kind of way of thinking and how much difference a certain tonal addition or subtraction would make you know say in the exterior you know where he said i've just got this one is with the owl hoot uh, and I've had four owls I've gone through, and I've combined actually two owls together. Only an ornithologist will know that. But <laughs> listen to the combination. Uh, and he said, and I've just put it a little bit of phasing on it. And it, it's, you mightn't even know that it's an owl, but it's a strange thing. And then listen to this, you know, and it'll demonstrate the sound. And then he'll say, now this is one with a wing flap. Um, but the wing flap's not from an owl. I took it for a pelican, but it, it's just got a certain breathiness to it. And you, you were just, you know, an hour would go by and you were sort of talking about, you know, a scene that, that was really just a shot and maybe four or five seconds it was going to be there. But that's the kind of detail he went into. Wow. So it's really important for you to collaborate with those people as opposed to being the kind of auteur boss? Oh, well, <laughs> things changed for me in the latter pictures, I mean, in earlier films, I mean, the great learning ground was here in, in Australia uh, in the 1970s when I started. And um, in a way, everything we were doing was new. There were a few people who were skilled in what they were doing. And we were feeling our way. We were, you know, very tight, small crews. And to a degree, you you were more in touch with the departments. For example, Foley. You know, I, I got into Foley on my early films because I loved it. That is to say, I would drop down every now and again to where they were recording and just loved it. I loved them, you know, thumping cabbages for a punch or <laughs> crunching across various types of gravel for yeah. footsteps. And because that linked to my early days of growing up before television with radio and there were certain programs I really loved that and I loved them when they had sound effects, you know, like uh, there was a detective show, Larry Kent, and uh, and they had, you know, obviously they were doing it with uh, in the studio live, probably. So it was pretty stark, the door opening, you know, again the sort of footsteps, uh, and someone striking a match. And my parents had bought a kind of waiting for television had bought a great big cabinet in which when television arrived, was to arrive, which was 1956, so we're talking about 53, 4, 5, we had the cabinet <laughs> ready for the set to be put into it. And at that stage, it was just a radio and a radiogram. But it had a cabinet beside it, which I guess was eventually to be full of LPs or something. So I used to lie down on the floor listening to my shows and put my head inside the cabinet which made, of course, a perfect kind of sound box so that there would be a little kind of a, a roominess to the sound. And so listening to Larry Kent, you know, you know, when he would say things like, you know, she walked into my office, you know, and did hear a bit of music, ba 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 boo 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 And then he'd hear a footsteps of a high-heeled shoes, uh, you know, on a kind of a wooden floor and created the mood for me in a very strong way for the show. Mm. So I loved sound really from that that radio influence mm. and probably never lost it. Now, as I got into more complex films and, uh, you know, the latter stage of working in America on, on big productions, 
you know, for example, the last two with Richard King, a master. Uh, he tended to do, we would sit and talk, but the conversation uh, was where I would put in my contribution. Uh, what are you after in this scene or whatever. He would then bring me later to very sophisticated uh, premixes in which he'd taken those ideas and expanded them on them and, and made them richer. Mm. Uh, he, in other words, was far better than I was in that area, yet we spoke the same language. Mm. You know, it was as if I was a pretty good piano player, but he was a concert uh, pianist of the highest caliber. So I could rough out a tune on the piano quite well, but he could, he could play. So therefore I was less involved in the kind of <laughs> making Foley uh, kind of experience. And so to a degree I missed that, but then I wouldn't, wouldn't have in the world wanted to have lost Richard King yeah. in order to uh, be with someone, you know, making sound effects. Mm. Mm. You mentioned um, the working in Australia in the 70s. Mm. That sounds like an incredible time and place for filmmaking. Um, what was it like back then? Everything was new. Everything was a, was a new milestone. You know, the first film to be accepted in the Cannes Film Festival or the first film to get a release in America. There were all these firsts, uh, the first box office success or the first... Uh, you know, anamorphic picture shot with uh, in the anamorphic uh, with anamorphic lens. So there are all those kind of things, um, and there was a sort of camaraderie amongst the crews, not necessarily between um, filmmakers. There was, in a way, a bit of rivalry with Melbourne and Sydney, um, a little kind of um, I don't know criticism in the writing about film which was unnecessarily extreme you know things tend to be either brilliant or ratchet you know and, and a pronouncement made about a new movie so there were that side of it i didn't like when you met your fellow directors of that era overseas you know in Cannes or in la for example uh they were great meetings we when we got together like frontline troops you know there was a camaraderie for the simple fact that you knew what it was like to be under fire, as it were, to extend the analogy. But in my case, I st starting in short films, as most people do, I was tipped head first into the world of making sound because my very first film, which was 12 minutes long, called Count Vim's Last Exercise, shot on 16 millimeter, millimeter black and white, made while I was at Channel 7 as a stagehand, to be part of a Christmas review mm -hmm. in which I was involved as the director of that. They gave me film stock uh, to make a little film as part of the program. And then we'd hired a hall. This was just for the staff and families. So it was one night only. It was about 350 people. And we had, you know, it was all comedy sketches. But after interval was to be uh, this, well, actually, I think 15-minute film, Count Vim, which I had made over the year. So I had made up a soundtrack, very crude, but it was narration because it was like a mock mockumentary style. So there was narration by me and then a little music and some basic sound effects. Uh, that was the soundtrack. So the day of the show, I'd put the film in a couple of days before to have um, an op the optical track made went down in the afternoon to Atlab, which was then at Channel 7 at Epping, to collect the print for the night's screening. And the man behind the counter, with a bit of a smirk, I must admit, said, sorry, mate, you're out of luck. I said, what do you mean? He said, we didn't have time to do it. You know, here's your sound, here's your film. I said, but I'm screening wow. tonight. Yeah. And he said, tough. <laughs> so I, I took the stuff that was in a cold sweat. Yeah and went to the theatre and we're getting ready for the live part of the performance. And I went up and saw the projectionist to take the film up to him and I said, there's no soundtrack. He said, oh, okay. I said, no, there's meant to be. I said, is there any way you could give me a live mic and I could sit in it, we reserve a seat in the front row and put the mic under the seat and I'll narrate it. I kind of remember the narration at least, otherwise it won't make sense. Yeah. 
He said, yeah, yeah, you can run a live mic out and I can, you know, hook that up to the speaker system. He said, you just go off, you know, as soon as you see the film, you can start talking. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. After an interval, the people on either side of this chair that had been reserved were rather surprised to see me <laughs> sitting in a mic. And even more surprised when I pulled out the microphone from under the chair. Mm -hmm. So up came the film, 15 minutes. I remembered every word of the narration, you know, just because I suppose I opened some secret compartment of my mind mm. that I have to survive. Mm. I have 350 people sitting behind me. It was like a pilot of a plane flying on one engine. You know, if the engine stops, then the plane crashes. I've got to make it work. So up came the image, just quite large in front of me, you know, looking up at quite a big image. You know, it was a Cadby format, but it looked pretty impressive. Um, it was a decent sized um, screen. And so I began the narration and then thought I'll put in a sound effects verbally. So I said, I said things like, this was the morning of Count Vim's final exercise. A cold wind blew through the city. <laughs> <laughs> the first person he met was Nurse Stone. <laughs> I kind of sunk her footsteps. <laughs> The people beside me, they're just they were thinking, what is this? It seems to be the sound coming from the screen. Is this guy sitting next to us, uh, who was one of the actors in the first half of the show? <laughs> uh, anyway, so I got through it. I was drenched in sweat, but it worked. And there was a really good applause, and I snuck away, and <laughs> we finished the show. Next day, the, the, you know, it was a great reaction to the to the. They'd never had a staff review before with a film, which they'd paid for. The staff um, had, a, had arranged that, the staff association. They then said, now we can, we're going to really do something for you. We'll really mix this well. You can do more sound effects on it. We're very excited about this, said the kind of management. And I said, no, I want to record it exactly as I did it last night. So they gave me a mic like this here today and put the film up and I did the same <laughs> soundtrack uh, because it was much more interesting <laughs> you know, than, real, than real effects. So you might say that was a film school experience you couldn't duplicate. It was, yeah. well, maybe you could. Yeah. You have to do all your sound effects and, and uh, all, the, all the voices. Yeah. So it led me with a, an absolute fascination of, um, you know, even for ADR, mm. Um, and for the fun you can have, you know, I remember one night waiting for David Gulpalil on The Last Wave, again at Channel 7, actually, to come in to do ADR. And he was late and we had his scenes naturally lined up. So I said, while we're waiting, I'd like to do David in French. And they said, oh, OK. So, you know, up came the scene and the line was winding across it where David arrived at a house or something. I said, Bonsoir, je suis avec Charlie. <laughs> Bonjour. Oui, c'est vrai, je suis espère. Well, rien du wrong. It did it like, you know, pretty good. You know, <laughs> rough, but it looked like a foreign film. Yeah. You know, where they, you expect the dubbing will be a bit off. So then the door crashed. <laughs> In came David Galpolo. I said, David, you know, have you done this stuff before? He said, yeah, I think so. I think, I think, yes, you do the voice. I said, yes, here, sit down. I just did you in French. What, 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 what? French? And he loved it. Ah, Peter! <laughs> I speak French. <laughs> but it broke the mood. And then we had a great night's ADR because the kind of stiffness that comes often with, uh, you know, seeing a studio like this where you're trying to... <laughs> Mm. recreate the atmosphere that you had on the set and mm. get the performances uh, is sometimes very difficult. Mm. I'd love to talk about uh, The Last Wave and Picnic mm. at Hanging mm. Rock because um, I feel like out of all of your kind of early Australian films that I've seen, they had really interesting mm. kind of soundtracks mm. and they were seen as quite uh, revolutionary at the time, weren't they, mm. those films? Uh, I can't recall much of you. You were so sort of anxious to, um, you know, to complete the film, to get it to the festival or whatever, and, you know, to hope for good reviews or what. I've forgotten all of that stuff. The making of it is what I do remember. 
And with those two pictures, we're talking about Greg Bell, who did the sound design. I mean, then they did, you didn't call it sound design, or it was called it was called whatever sound effects or something. Mm. But he was a designer. In fact, Alan Splat said to me in America, and Alan, as we've talked about, was you know, in, no longer alive, but he you know, was one of the most highly regarded sound designers uh, in the world. And he said, oh, I was very aware, aware of Greg Bell. Oh, really? Mm. Wow. And he said, you know, we didn't mention those two pictures. Wow. Yeah. Of mine and no doubt others. Mm. So Greg contributed greatly to those and loved the fact that he and I would sit as you and I are now in a room and talk a lot yeah. in the early stages about what sort of mood to create because both pictures mm. in different ways depended on a mood being created that mm. was part of the experience of the film, particularly mm. Picnic. Mm. And here's where you have to say, as a filmmaker, how change happens mm. and you have to accept it. But it's a great shame mm. that television is now the paramount uh, way that uh, a filmmaker's work will be released, with the exception of, uh, mm. of you know, big you know, sequel blockbusters, fantasy films, by and large. Yeah. Yes, we still have a sort of in quotes, you know, small art house world, but it's very, very tough, and it's festival oriented, and you have to get noticed at the festivals, because the experience of watching a film in your lounge room or someone's room or whatever. Compared with being in a theatre mm. where the doors close and the lights dim and you're with strangers mm. uh, is very different mm. because of sound. Uh, also because television is oriented toward dialogue for the very reason that people are distracted. They're moving, often moving around the room or crossing it or something. So you've got to keep them listening. And if you're going to create an atmosphere you know, that is to do with strange sound effects, it's not going to work well in the lounge room. Mm. You know, people get impatient. Mm. Again, generalizing and not everybody. Mm. But that is, um, so therefore a lot of this conversation is really, of course, about the experience of watching something in a large room yeah. with strangers. Yeah. What do you think of um, uh, the r really recent um, developments in surround sound like Dolby Atmos? I mean, uh, the Wayback came out before mm. Dolby Atmos, right? Mm. Mm. But, mm. I mean, um, your early Australian films, would they even have been surround? No. Yeah, they no. were just stereo. So, like, yeah. how, how did you find uh, that change in your way of working? Uh, well, I've never been much of a fan of surround sound. Really? Yeah. No. I think I share that with Stanley Kubrick, I read. Really? Uh, yeah. That he liked the central speaker. Mm-hmm that your attention is focused primarily right in front of you at the screen mm. um, and that any dimension is you should be in relation to what's happening on that screen rather than off the screen. Yeah. And now with having said that, there are people who have mastered that, no doubt, and there'd be film experiences in which the surround that you would know probably more than I would are, you know, exemplary. Mm. But there, it, it depends again then on the room and how well it's been tuned mm -hmm. because we've all had that experience of yeah. saying, is there someone knocking at the door yeah. outside? You know, and say, no, that's coming from the movie. Yeah. And that's not good. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really distracting. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, I, I think the, the technical side of both sound and image it, to me is interesting but not significant in other words it's really uh, that's apart from the difference between film and television mm. but it's really the power of the image that counts mm. in other words let's say you know two of the most powerful pieces of, of film you can think of uh if, as we sit here i would just grab from documentary i would suppose mm. the assassination of president kennedy mm. on the zapruder film uh and the Hindenburg balloon disaster, yeah, yeah. in which I think the only sound of those two would be the, the Hindenburg. I think we, you hear probably the cameraman. Mm. So, oh, my God. Uh, oh, my God. And some shouting as we see the massive uh, Hindenburg blimp coming down uh, engulfed in flame, knowing there are people on board. Kennedy, you can... I, the brain supplies a, a soundtrack mm. 
for that. I mean, usually if you see that clip and it's always around and, and forever, it's probably someone talking over it, you know, for a documentary. Mm -hmm. But if you watch it silent, the brain will provide almost everything, almost the shots, mm. uh, almost the breaths of uh, his wife, almost the sort of, you know, a sigh from him as his life slips away, a shout from a, a one of the uh, bodyguards. Um, so in a way, it's, it firstly begins with the power of the image and then to be, I think, as simple as you can in, in the design of the sound that, that, that you're going to add to that image. And I think that principle uh, I've stuck with pretty much all through my filmmaking. And so sitting with Greg Bell back in those early pictures, you know, like uh, Picnic and Hanging Rock, where sound really can, because it was very important, as I said, mm. we'd talk about uh, what the film, what, what can create a mood in the case of that picture that was unsettling. And um, that led us, whoever's idea it was, probably Greg's, to take the sound of a, an earthquake. Um, or maybe it came from me because I was reading Carl Jung at the time right. in which he talked about there are certain primal sounds inside a human being that he believed, he argued, mm. were there from time immemorial, from the sort of um, the human amnesia that he said that, you know, which we for forget, but in our blood, in our DNA has come something of experiences from past the past. In other words, you can be afraid of a certain sound that is, he said, I think he said in his book, an earthquake, if, even although you've never experienced one. If you heard that sound, you would be instantly afraid. And he then mentioned a couple of other sounds that were similar. And so Greg and I talked about, so he took a sound, uh, sound of an earthquake slowed it down because we didn't want people thinking, oh, it's an earthquake, mm -hmm. and then worked on the optical track to get it just uh, registering um, so that, you know, you wouldn't know it was there, so to speak. So that so that in sitting in your seat, in it needed prime, really good screen, a good, yeah. good sound system <coughs> in the theatre. Uh, you would we would create a feeling of unease. And I knew it was working when I got here and there reports of people would say to me, I don't know what it was about that film, but, you know, sort of during it, I felt uneasy at times. And I, I guess that was part of the story, I guess, wasn't it? What's going on? You know, what's, why did, what's happened to these girls have disappeared? Another time I had a guy say to me, yeah, that was a strange film. He said, I kept hearing this kind of rumble. And I thought, is the theater over a, Subway. I was saw it in you know where it was New York or something. Yeah, and I thought, oh no, that's wow, that's that earthquake. Yeah, I I definitely felt that. I definitely felt this kind of this kind of an emptiness in the soundtrack, but there was something mm. there. And what I found really unsettling in the soundtrack of Picnic at Hanging Rock was the contrast between um kind of traditional uh, score with like piano. Mm. And traditional instruments, and then this, uh, and then this uh, electronic stuff. Um, and it was the same in Last Wave. Last Wave had a lot of electronic mm. score as well. <coughs> what were you uh, kind of influenced by at the time? Was that the kind of music you were into? It was a great year of electronic music, and I was, <clears throat> you know, very um, excited by it, really. Mm. Um, stuff Pink Floyd were doing, <clears throat> Van Gelis um, and others. And um, it was ideally suited for film. I think with, um, you know, film seems to respond or certain films with a repetition that came with, you know, some of the basic background um, pads for electronic tracks. So, you know, you can, you can imagine the guys were sitting there you know, late at night probably, uh, experimenting away and, and so they'd get a do 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 and then they'd add something to that which is not a way you would normally of course in any way start with uh composing music because it's you know most composers would probably work off the piano and uh with a melody so uh so the 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 kind of 
intersection of music and sound effects was uh, apparent in uh, electronic music and was a deep influence. And in fact, it reached a point on one film where the tracks laid for um, an ambient mood I used as music, mm. which was Richard King, and it was on my last film, The Way Back. Yeah. In the opening scenes of that film, the kind of title scenes, um, that is Richard and not the composer. And he, he just, you know, we had these kind of conversations, you know, and he, he could make um, sound effects work as music. And, mm. you know, he's in a sense a, a composer, mm. really. It's all sound. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I said, you know, you have a real talent for that. Mm. And uh, I remember passing on to Lee Smith, my editor, who um, was working and has worked with many films with Chris Nolan. Mm. When they were going to do uh, um, Dunkirk, you know, I said to Lee, oh, I don't know if you ever thought about it. You should, you know, tell Christopher Nolan that he should get Richard to, um, you know, compose some music. Mm. Um, well, of course, he had Hans Zimmer, so it probably never came up. But, <laughs> uh, but it's you know you can't make your effects have um, the same do the same job and better than music in certain instances. Yeah, yeah. So, make it more organic. You know, yeah. whereas music is so often naturally imposed. Yeah, yeah. Um, something I'm going to jump back to something you mm. said earlier, and I hope I'm not pra- paraphrasing too much. You said something about. Um, trying to keep the soundtrack as simple as possible. Mm, mm. Is that right? So do you mean you try and make the soundtrack as minimal as possible? Like you start with a blank picture and then add until you have just enough? The idea, you know, I used to draw it on my script sometimes, K-I-double-S, keep it simple, stupid. Mm. It applies to all areas. I think the... the um, I always knew that, in, you know, in attempting to... Um, be a master of this craft of filmmaking, which should take a lifetime, mm. uh, that um, really in the end it would be simplicity that would give me my, you know, access to that kind of a title or at least to aspire to it. Mm. Uh, less is more, you know, there are these kind of phrases that have really uh, come into being because of their basic truth. Mm. So I like to, yes, I like to sort of simplify both, you know, my shooting plan for the day or, you know, what am I really trying to do here? Mm. What do I want? What do I want people to feel? I'm always thinking the audience. I, I grew up that way, mm. you know, as, as a kind of actor, mm. writer, director. I acted in a lot of mainly reviews, mm. but on television, on film and, and uh, at university kind of stuff in the 60s. So I was very early on out in front of an audience in a live situation, as you know, particularly, and therefore spent my life making uh, artifacts, films for the consumption of audiences uh, for which they paid <laughs> uh, to buy a ticket and which kept me in business. So I was always terribly aware of the audience and what I wanted them to feel. And on each cut, I think pretty much from the beginning, I certainly remember it with Picnic, so at least by my second film. Um, well, really, it, let me put it another way. When videotape came, it was a wonderful thing. You could take the film home. So that's probably a bit after that. Uh, I would watch it at home silent. Mm. And I always do that now. Mm. Um, you know, it means I might come and go in the room a bit mm. at home, just on the television. Mm. Um but I like to see how it plays with nothing but the ambient sounds of the house. Interesting. Distant voice, you know, someone laughing. Um, and I learn a lot. I learn how to simplify it and I learn often how to tighten it. But I'll also learn a lot about sound mm. by having none. It was almost always my ambition, I never achieved it, to make a film without music mm. where the sound was the music. It wasn't necessary. Um but I never, never got there. Mm. Mm. One of your films that I think is really interesting when talking about that idea is Master and Commander, because mm. war films, 
I feel like it's such a difficult balance between bombarding an audience with sensory information that yeah. will make that that will make them feel like they're there and part mm. of it, but also n- not doing it too much so that you overwhelm them and make it an unpleasant experience. So how do you, how do you balance that minimalism in like that first ten minutes of Master and Commander mm. in the where, you know, cannons and people shouting and... Work stuff. with very good people. Yeah. And that's back to Richard King, sound designer. That he, he just uh, understands that. Mm. Uh, also, we'd had our conversations in which he knew I understood it. Mm. And he made such beautiful individual sounds. So he, he was interested in and recorded original uh, firing of a cannon. He went out to a, you know, a military base uh, where they had... Uh, working cannons or he bought the cannons and he fired at wooden structures he had built um, and, you know, mic the impact exterior and the interior, so to speak, of the entering cannonball and the shattering of the wood as it went in. And then, you know, of course, mic the trajectory of the cannonball. And um, these were luscious sounds and sounds I'd never heard and most people had never heard. Who, who, how do you know what it sounds like? And we tend to th- see cannons as quaint. And when you see them, you know, whether it's a 21-gun salute for the birth of a royal child or whatever, it's sort of poof, bang, poof, bang, you know, it's kind of nothing. Mm. And you tend to patronise <laughs> the weaponry of the past, you know, yeah. the old pirate ships have these old cannons. Yeah. When you really hear what they, they sound like and what they can do, you realise you wouldn't want to be anywhere near the receiving mm. end. So when it came to the mixing of it, he really had all those stages available. Mm. Uh, naturally, didn't hear the, the original firing if we were you know, on the receiving end of a round, but uh, oh, gee, it was delicious in the theatre to hear that cannonball rip through wood and uh, the tear of a shirt if someone was hit, someone crying out. And um, our first passes tended to be too complex and I'd say oh, I've lost that I can't hear that cannonball anymore mm. and we'd thin it out and so Richard and I and uh, very good mixers were always looking to thin the thing out mm. and sometimes to take it all out um, to another film of mine with a plane crash in it in Fearless um, with Jeff Bridges we had the impact of the plane filmed from inside the cabin of the aircraft I always decided I didn't want any exterior shots but to have the point of view of the passengers uh, the unfortunate passengers as the point of view that we would we would use and what a fantastic set of sounds were laid up everything that could rip and break and tear and you know it was it was just uh, agonizing to watch it, breathtaking. But I then asked them to run it with no sound and then asked them to run it with just the music. Mm -hmm. And we all looked at each other and said, it's the music Mm -hmm. Uh, because it added a dreamlike quality. Mm -hmm. And having spoken to half a dozen survivors of that aircraft accident, DC-10 accident, they also had one thing they said in common. It was unreal. But just watching Master and Commander, I... I, I just thought about what a logistical challenge it would have been getting some of the shots and material of that film. Absolutely. Uh, very complex and asked each of each department that they, you know, give me the best work they were capable of or reach further than they've ever done before. And, um, and despite a, a large budget, you're always short of time. But I, I did have wonderful people, and we've talked a lot about Richard and the effects, sound effects he did on that, Canon impacts and the sails, how he made the sails come alive. Went out in the Mojave Desert. Uh, he tried it at sea and had, didn't have enough control over the vessel itself, or, or let alone the wind mightn't be up. So he rigged a kind of miniature weird looking sail apparatus, because I only saw his stools, on the top of a pickup truck and went out in the Mojave Desert and made the sails flat by moving the vehicle. Um, I don't know how he kept the sound of the engine out, but maybe he cut the engine at a certain speed and then dealt with the sound of the wheels on the desert later and eliminated, but got great flapping canvas and, you know, sound of wind filling a canvas. 
Then I must say, did fantastic work done by Richard Taylor at Weta Workshop in New Zealand. Uh, Richard built two miniatures of the two ships, the French ship, uh, the Acheron, and the surprise of Jack Aubrey's, the Russell Crowe character. And they were exquisite. They were sort of huge, you know, as, as Richard said, with miniatures, the bigger you can build them, the better mm. for uh, the work you're doing. So it would have been, you know, I mean, I suppose the um, bigger was the friendship. It would have been, I think, at least 25 metres long. And as you stood on the ground with it up, you know, and in its cradle would have been two and a half metres high. We put the water in later digitally. But he did, you know, the battle scenes with those two ships in miniature, particularly when the end scene, when they're in close contact, uh, firing cannonballs that he made up, which were little kind of BB pellets, but of a special size and weight that he fired through BB guns at uh, the each ship in turn. And uh, they were surprisingly effective, and he could get quite close with his cameras to some of those impacts. I mean, had to be careful, obviously, we didn't have crew on board, although some were put in digitally. So I had part mock-up real ship of the French ship uh, and um, these miniatures to work with, mm -hmm. then uh, CGI. Um, so it was um, extremely elaborate and a tremendous canvas for sound. And he justifiably uh, won the Academy Award for that work. Mm -hmm. Do you find it more difficult having kind of creative control on those big budget films mm. where there's large crews and like lots of people to kind of manage? I think from a distance, you know, if I think if, you know, even as I'd approach work on any morning during that film, I'm filming at uh, Rosarito, at what was then the Fox Tank uh, in Mexico. And as I was approaching from my home, which was down the coast a bit, you know, I was there for months, but every day that I'd go there to work, I would get the same feeling. About a kilometre or two away from the studio, you could see from the highway as you approached the ship sitting in the tank mm. and you could see all these ants moving around of the crew. And I would get that slight kind of stomach clutch. Wow. Uh, and then, you know, think, my God, we've got a whole ship in the tank and all 800 crew and then as you arrive and you walk through the various or drive through the various departments and props are lying out and people are wandering around in makeup. And of course, we had to have most of the actors dressed every day ready in case we move from one deck to another, mm. which was difficult for makeup as much as for actors to be standing by. Um, and it would all be like that till you got onto the set with the camera all of that behind you and there's the scene you're shooting for the day and then it was no different to the early films i'd shot you know no different to my first film you're just focused on the shot you're getting or the scene you're doing yeah. and uh it's always challenging and it's always exciting and i love doing that you know i was born to i was I'm, i think i'm a fish in water you know it's it is natural to me to make films it was fortunately wow. uh, i found the metier that i was meant to find master and commander one best sound editing mm. Oscar, right? Yes. Do you think, do you feel like that's your film with the best sound? Do you have any particular favourite? No, I mean, I think, well, perhaps in one way, rather than favourite, I'd say one in which I needed help more than any other. Mm. It would be Picnic at Hanging Rock. Uh, I mean, it, Picnic at Hanging Rock was a mystery story without a solution. And I was aware that that was both its most attractive feature when I read the book. How daring, uh, how intriguing, what happened? You could think about it as you put the book away. Um, but how dangerous for a film because of the expectations of the audience to know who done it. And I remember a quote of Hitchcock's in which he said, it's the most difficult form of cinema because it's the most disappointing resolution. Uh, oh, is that what it was? The butler did it. Mm -hmm. I even felt that as a kid with Sherlock Holmes. You know, I used to love Sherlock Holmes, but not the last page mm -hmm. where it was all explained. Yeah. So here was a film with what I loved, but which carried great risk. So the 
challenge pretty clearly to me right off was to create an atmosphere in which the audience didn't want a conventional solution or certainly didn't expect one. I had to make the film dreamy in a kind of way that you thought, this is not your normal Inspector Plod, you know, mm. arresting the, the, the perpetrator. Mm. So I had to sit down with Greg and say, I need your help. And as I shot the picture, same with uh, Russell Boyd on, with the camera, we experimented and shot a lot. Um, it different frame rates, um, you know, so that I would shoot, uh, you know, 32 frames a second, just very slight slow motion, ask the actors not to blink, swallow. Wow. Uh, so they wouldn't give the game away and made sure there weren't any, uh, you know, we couldn't do it where there was a wind blow. Mm. Uh, then with that imagery, then shoot at 24 frames a second. So the dialogue was there naturally un unaffected, but the person listening would be listening at 32 frames a second mm -hmm. in his cut, you know, intercut shot yeah. um, other than when he was talking. Uh, then to the soundtrack, you know, we would add perhaps that uh, distant, faint, not quite a rumble, earthquake slowed down. And a lot done with insects uh, and birds. Uh, so nature was uh, part of that mood. Uh, and then I had the wonderful music of George Zamfir, the pan pipes, which, you know, brought in a kind of, uh, you know, sort of a, an atmosphere yeah. of their own Aerial ancient kind of. instrument. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess my time is nearly up. <laughs> but uh, so I'll just ask one last question that I guess every interview asks. Mm. It's been nine years since your last film is <laughs> anything coming up nothing uh mm. visible maybe yeah. something below the horizon mm. but um most of the things i get offered are and some of them kind of interesting are television mm. and um yes i'm sure there's a an interesting little six-part series that i might come across but but uh as you can probably tell from the tone of my voice, talk of sound, that I'm not that excited by television. Mm, mm. And I'm trained for uh, the big screen. If I use the war analogy, I'd say I'm a fighter pilot being asked to come and fly bombers. You know, and you say, yeah, I can fly a bomber, mm. but it's just like driving a bus. Give me a jet. <laughs> there you go everybody peter weir if you want to learn more about the sound perspective podcast head to this episode's page on our site tonemenderspodcast.com you can find sound perspective on any major podcast app so go get it there's a great back catalog if you're a fan of tone Menders, i think you'll be interested in everything they have on their feed as well and also, you get to listen to those great Australian accents all day. What more do you want in life, eh? So thank you very much for listening. We'll be back with the regular Tone Menders podcast up next. So stay tuned. Talk to you soon. Bye now. Tone Menders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tone Benders, and join Tone Benders podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or b &H, or leave us a tip. Just go to ToneBendersPodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening.